your one job as a parent is to protect your children. And so, um, Alyssa was diagnosed with leukemia on a Monday afternoon. And she died 10 days later. You do not die of leukemia in 10 days. She died of medical errors. She got a hospital-acquired infection with a C. diff. Um, there was a boy in the room next door to her in this hospital. They shared bathrooms. And he got C. diff and died. But I didn't find that out until months later. She became septic. But they had ordered lab tests to look at this. And when the lab tests came back, they showed there were critical values and no one acted on them. They did last rites before she went into surgery. And to sit there and think, you might not get your child back again. But she came out of the surgery and it was then that they told us there's nothing they could do. She died a painful and a horrific death. One of the hardest things, it's, um, it's the loss of hopes and dreams. What would her future have looked like? What was her career? For so long, I couldn't take a family picture because I couldn't have that missing piece. I, f I fought for years to try to get answers. And that is inhumane to treat someone that way after you've had a loss. And it took the organization three years, seven months, and 28 days to meet with me and have the first real honest conversation. And one of the biggest gifts anyone can give us after loved one's been harmed is transparency. The first thing is tell us what happened. The second thing is take accountability. The third is I'm sorry. Those words are so powerful and if they're genuine, I mean, I don't know anyone that when they've heard him just doesn't break down and cry. The fourth is tell us how you're going to fix the problem. One of the things we need to know is if we've lost a child or a loved one and we know it's happened again, then it's like their loss was in vain. But the fifth one that I think is becoming more and more important is let us be part of the solution if we want to be part of the solution. And for a couple reasons. For some people, it's the way to know the problem was fixed. For others, it's a healing factor. And for some, it's a way to honor their loved ones. Please welcome Dr. Michael Ramsey. Wow, those movies are really moving. Um, so uh, our next speaker was with us last year, and uh, she's agreed to come back this year and give us an update. It's Dr. Michelle Schreiber. Uh, she's the Deputy Director of Center for Clinical Standards and Quality and Director of Quality Measurement and Value-Based Incentives Group for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So please welcome Dr. Michelle Schreiber. Please welcome Dr. Michelle Schreiber. It is so difficult to come after a story like Alyssa's. Um, there, there aren't words for that kind of pain. But I want to not only express my deep sympathies, but to say that I think all of us are truly committed to trying to make this better. I'd like to thank the Patient Safety uh, Movement and the Foundation for inviting uh, me to return this time. 
and to bring you up to date with some of the things that the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services are doing for patient safety, because we also believe that it is a fundamental imperative to first do no harm in healthcare. Those of you who are from other countries, CMS is the largest payer, the government payer, in the United States. We ensure pretty close to one out of two individuals now. Our budget is over a trillion dollars a year, and we are truly very interested in making sure that that care is safe. We are also the regulators. So let me speak a little bit about what CMS is doing about advancing safety for all individuals. Across CMS, we have multiple payer agencies, right? Medicare, Medicaid, the Innovation Center, the Marketplace. Um, and they haven't always worked in conjunction with each other. But I will say in the last several years, really driven in part by COVID, we work together as an agency collaboratively. And we have a quality and safety strategy and an equity strategy really across the entire agency. We meet weekly to really make sure that we are aligned, both of our measures and our policies. And as Craig Umscheid pointed out, we're meeting with all of our federal partners, actually, and really trying to align a federal response around this. this is, these are the goals of the CMS National Quality Strategy. And you can see that safety features prominently here. We all know where we are now. Craig showed very nice slides that for over a decade or more, we were making good incremental improvement wasn't enough because the OIG and others uh, showed that there still was a lot of harm. But during COVID, we really suffered a significant deterioration in our patient safety metrics. Many reasons, multifactorial, but the bottom line is that our systems weren't resilient. Our safety systems weren't resilient. Quality and safety folks, as a matter of fact, were some of the first people who were laid off during COVID because they didn't produce RVUs. Unacceptable. We can't have systems that aren't resilient. And so the good news, however, is that we are starting to come back and there is cause for optimism. So CDC's most recent data on their healthcare acquired infection progress report shows improvement since the end of the pandemic. So you can see the numbers that are here. So cause for optimism, but we still have a ways to go. CMS's approach to advancing safety, again, through our quality and safety committee that meets weekly, we are looking at all of our components and all of our multiple levers for how we can advance safety. We're doing it component by component. That means Medicare, Medicaid, and so forth and so on across the agency and again, across the entire federal government, particularly with AHRQ, with CDC, with ONC, now called ASTP, the Office of the National Coordinator for IT. We're working with the VA, the Department of Defense, the FDA, HRSA, SAMHSA. So there is a really concerted effort. If you take away anything, I, I please want you to understand, there's a true concerted effort across the federal government to make an impact. We haven't been doing nothing, hopefully. CMS has had multiple activities now to advance patient safety with the commitment to zero harm. So in 2022, 23, and, and really going into the rest of this year, and I'm gonna to have to move, because honestly, I can't read that far. <laughs> I know them all, but I truly can't read that far. Some of you may be familiar with the Birth Friendly Initiative. Actually, it is a designation program where organizations have to attest that they're doing quality improvement around birth-friendly care. This is to reduce maternal mortality and increase maternal safety. Over time, this will be linked to specific outcome reports, and this is very visible. Virtually all commercial payers in the United States have taken this up as well, so we're very excited about that. Many of you have heard about the patient safety structural measure that CMS finalized really just in the past couple of months. And you've seen some of the domains that are there. Reporting starts in 2025, and that too, like the birth-friendly designation, this is a measure, will evolve over time to include more of the best evidence-based safe practices to ask hospitals and then other facilities, we regulate virtually every healthcare facility, whether or not they are following all of these evidence-based practices. 
we finalized a series of electronic clinical quality measures, getting to some comments from earlier today of how do we make measurement more transparent and simpler and part of the workflow that we all have and get that information from our electronic medical records so that it flows seamlessly. So CMS is really moving towards digitizing quality measurement. So is NCQA. So this is a trend that is going to continue. So it will eventually be fire-based reporting, information that comes directly from the EMRs. But this isn't simple. This requires not only the EMR vendors to collaborate on this, but all systems as they implement their EMR have to really design their workflow around the flow of this data. It also requires a lot of standardization of data. A lot of that is being done by ONC through the US CDI, United States Core Data Interoperability Set. And CMS is doing a lot of work there around quality measurement and standardizing it. We've proposed several new conditions of participation this year, one around maternal care and one around nursing homes, including the nursing home staffing uh, mandates that have been sort of controversial, but nursing home safety is really very important and is ripe for improvement. We finalized the TSET, the transition for uh, coverage of new um, devices so that we can make innovation, give it a, a faster pathway so that innovations actually get paid for. And finally, we've proposed um, elements of other monitoring around quality assurance and improvement in the home and community case care-based care settings. In the next year, and we will be working obviously tirelessly for many years to come on this, we are identifying the priority areas. So Joe, you asked us to identify priority areas. I have them on a slide. You've got them. We've done it. Um, but we are working really to support and to evaluate safety reporting um, through the tracking of serious safety events. Some of you may know this. I think it's still open for public comment. CMS helped fund the National Quality Foundation to look at their serious safety event list, in other words, the never event, and really update that. It hadn't been updated since 2009. So how do we update that, bring it up to current standards, and then hold people accountable to that? So I think, if I'm not mistaken, that's still open for comment on the National Quality Forum website. We're supporting, really, the unique identification of facilities for reporting. One of the challenges, so CMS does a lot of public reporting, right? We have Care Compare, we have various hospital stars programs, but we report through what's called the CCN, the CMS certification number. Sounds reasonable, except that in some cases, multiple facilities report under a single CCN, for example, if they're a system, which makes it almost impossible to find facility A, B, C, D individually, as opposed to just being rolled up into a single CCN. This is actually surprisingly hard to fix, but CMS is committed to making our data transparent by individual facilities. We are very committed to making sure that the patient voice matters, both through having measures that evaluate whether or not patients have been asked about patient safety and what their comments are, the ability for patients to actually report, because we think that patient safety cannot be solved without the patients deeply involved and engaged. And finally, we've been working on more metrics um, around patient safety, including diagnostic excellence and drug shortages. All right, here's our list, Joe. These are the overarching arms, seven of them, that CMS, at least, has identified as our key priorities. You can see them um, called out here. Many of them are things that you're familiar with. Some of them are a little bit newer, like diagnostic excellence, and we know that AHRQ is actually funding work around this. We're very excited about that. Abuse and neglect in care settings, something that people may not think about all the time, but really very important. And health information technology, the safety of health information technology, the safety of our EMRs, and eventually the safety of AI. I spoke a little bit about the electronic clinical quality measures. Again, we're very committed to driving this through digital reporting, 
for a number of reasons, including the fact that you can layer on advanced analytics and eventually AI, but you can also use these in real time as trigger tools. So facilities can actually look, and many of you have said this, on a daily basis at how you are performing, and you can use that in your daily safety huddles to really intervene at the time of when you know that something is going on. So you can see a whole suite of electronic clinical quality measures around safety that CMS has proposed or is in the process of doing. We talked about the patient safety structural measure. You've already seen these domains. And again, reporting for that starts just in a few months. The main focus of the patient safety structural measure aligned, as Craig said, very intentionally with the National Action Plan and has a very heavy emphasis on leadership and governance because that truly is where safety starts in any organization. And it was wonderful to hear from many of the CEOs and many of the organizations who are here today talking about their commitment and their culture of safety. So CMS has been asked for what are our commitments to safety? And really, they boil down to a few things. And we stole shamelessly thank you to the patient safety, um, sa patients for PSSM, patient safety movement, who really has laid out, see the harm, fix the harm, don't pay for the harm. And there actually also probably has to be some statutory and legal change. So for us, this is promote transparency, advance a safety culture through partnerships, and incentivize zero harm, or to where we can, don't pay for harm. So under promoting transparency, our key initiatives include increasing our quality measures, as we've spoken of already, the safety component, making sure there is a safety component in all of our value-based programs. We have over 30 value-based programs, and so we don't have a safety component in all of them. Our commitment is to have a safety component in all of them. I spoke already about reporting by individual facility and about developing patient experience measures, supporting some of our measurement through NHSN, which is the CDC's way of driving improvements in safety. So many of us report like healthcare acquired infections to NHSN. Some of our patient safety measures will start going through NHSN. And so um, really creating a national repository of safety measures, which is different but has to be in concert with AHRQ's patient safety organization adverse event reporting. So the two go hand in hand, but they're somewhat different. And finally, I think still out for public comment in the outpatient rule is we were seeking comment this year on strengthening the role of safety in hospital stars. For example, should a hospital be designated as a five-star hospital, the CMS seal of approval that you are the best hospital if your safety is in the bottom quartile? And so we're looking for comment on that and action probably next year. Multiple partnerships, Craig outlined multiple partnerships. I spoke of multiple partnerships because we all have to be working on this together leadership and governance, the culture of safety, high reliability, best practices. And here I think the VA is actually going to set the tone for high reliability practices. But most importantly, the inclusion of patients and caregivers, because again, we can't do this without amplifying their voices and making sure that they're included. And I do wanna mention interoperability as a safety issue. Interoperability is not just a tech issue. Interoperability is a safety issue so that we have all the data that we need and we have to make sure that the data is correct. Because if you layer on AI algorithms on incorrect data, and I will tell you a lot of that data out there is bad, we're going to have bad outcomes. Finally, incentivizing zero harm. We would like to be able to say we won't pay for harm but there are statutory limitations around this. Um, and I think we always have to do it in a fair way. So CMS is evaluating this. How do we incentivize better safety? How do we disincentivize poorer safety? And we are evaluating what the options are. 
These all align very nicely with the PCAS report. You've seen the PCAS recommendations. Our uh, work aligns very closely, intentionally, with the PCAS recommendations. I think one of the challenges is how do we align? So I've talked about all of this work that is ongoing, and you've seen a lot of organizations working on this. We need to make sure we are doing this together aligned so that we're not sending mixed messages and so that we are each amplifying the strengths that each of us bring so that we are coordinating and not sending mixed messages to facilities or to patients. And we've already spoken of a lot of cross HHS collaboration. I just wanted to highlight many of the things that are here. Craig spoke of them already, but please do take away the message that the federal government is truly committed to improving safety and is working in a very collaborative way, not only to implement the PCAST recommendations, but to really use all of the levers that we have in the most effective way to improve patient safety. My final slide is if you're more interested in what CMS is doing, there's a link here to our quality in motion, but I thank you for the opportunity to present today, and I thank you all for what you're doing. Thank you.